Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Insyaallah uh, for today's topic is uh, surveys uh, in most um, uh, dissertations and uh, research papers in business and management, Islamic finance. Um, there are many studies who have used the survey method. Uh, for some reasons, survey method is, is quite popular, not only among lecturers, but also among the students. So there are many ways to do survey. Survey is a general term. Survey can be questionnaires, can be interviews, and uh, the survey methods involves uh, asking respondents questions face to face. We call interview or by telephone or via questionnaires of individuals. And among students at Unishams, a questionnaire is the most uh, popular method to collect the um, primary data. So, uh, so there are some advantages and disadvantages of uh, questionnaires. Among the advantages of questionnaires are number one, questionnaires are manageable because usually students have a limited time and uh, limited uh, resources. So I think it's the most popular method of collecting data because of the um, manage manageability and also because there are many previous studies who have used questionnaires so researchers and students can um, can follow the steps uh, at least can have a benchmark on how to progress so let's see the steps in uh, using a survey the first step is design of the survey, for example, design of the questionnaire, write the questions. After writing the questions, it's a good idea to do the pilot study, or we call pilot the survey. And then uh, if um, there is uh, no alterations, uh, we can go ahead and administer the actual survey. And if there are some alterations, the alterations need to be made because some, some of the items or the questions in the questionnaire, um, they, have, uh, they have gone into some, uh, uh, they, they do not pass the test of uh, validity and uh, reliability. Okay, so after the pilot survey, uh, sometimes you, uh, the researchers don't have to make alterations. Sometimes they have to make the alterations. Uh, and then after the alterations, if necessary, then the researcher will administer the survey. And then um, administer means to distribute the survey. And then uh, once the, the questionnaires are collected, uh, the data will go to the process of data entry. Uh, you can um, enter the data into Excel or SPSS. And then analyze the data. There are many software to analyze the data. The simplest one is SPSS. And then the more complicated one is PLS-SAM and uh, Amos, Amos Sam. And then you need to report in your chapter four, the findings of the research, the findings of the study. So, uh, 
what's the best way to design um, the questionnaire? Uh, Mr. Hamza, how, how do you design your questionnaire, for example? Uh, I, I base on my um, research objectives right. and uh, research questions right. to direct my, my questionnaire. Yeah. Right. Yes, Doctor. That's how how do you write your uh, the items in the questionnaire? The, the items? Yeah, in the questionnaires you will have what uh, you call constructs. And in each construct there are items. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. okay, before writing questionnaire, you must have a theoretical framework. Okay. Before writing questionnaire, you must come up with your theoretical framework. And your theoretical framework, like Mr. Hamza said, comes from your objectives and your research questions. Okay. Uh, okay. All right, this is an example of a theoretical framework. Uh, like uh, we discussed before, it's very important that you have a strong theoretical framework that can be justified. So in order to come up with your theoretical framework, you need to do the literature review. And uh, it's always a good idea to have the full research uh, on the topic that you are trying to do. Um, for example, this uh, theoretical framework is based on TPB, the theory of planned behavior. And in the theory of planned behavior, there are five uh, constructs or five variables, attitude, subjective norm, perceived behavioral control. These are called independent variables. Can you see the slide that I'm sharing? Yes, we're seeing the slide. Okay. And intention is, intention is the, the mediating variable and compliance behavior is the dependent variable. Uh, and then in this uh, framework, um, the researcher add another variable as a contribution, uh, moral obligation. And then uh, Islamic religiosity here is the uh, moderating variable, which moderates the relationship between attitude and intention, subjective norm and intention, perceived behavioral control and intention and moral obligation and intention. So before, before we start writing uh, the items in our questionnaire, the theoretical framework must be justified, meaning all the variables that you include in the theoretical framework must have justifications. For example, why moral obligation is included here? Why religiosity is included here? And why each of the variables is important in the context that you are trying to study? Examiner will ask you lots of questions on why uh, you include these variables why Islamic religiosity is the moderating variable, why intention is the 
mediating variable, define moderating variable, define mediating variable. Okay, so the best way to justify, like we discussed before, is to look at the previous studies. Uh, you, you can make certain um, adjustment or adaptation uh, as a contribution of the study. Once we are uh, okay with the theoretical framework, meaning the, uh, the variables are justified, then we need to develop the hypothesis. So in this study, this theoretical framework uh, is adopted from Eisen, Kamel, Zaino, and Ram al Jafri, and also based on deductive reasoning. The deductive reasoning is used to expand the theoretical framework and to add new variables to the theoretical framework as suggested by Cagliotto, Matila, and Pento 2002. So these are the things that you should write. Okay, so then you need to explain the theoretical framework. For example, attitude um, is included based on the previous studies. So these are the studies, the previous studies, which uh, included attitude as the independent variable. And then, okay, you need to explain a little, a little bit more about the, <clears throat> the first independent variable, all right. And then, uh, you need to explain why more, why you add certain variable, why you choose that variable as moderating variable. Everything needs to be justified, and the best way is to uh, cite the previous studies. All right, any questions so far? Any questions so far, Mr. Azli? Mr. Hamza, any question? Cikgu Norma, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, so much, uh, of, um... <laughs> Go ahead. So I've, I've seen the theoretical framework. Okay. Can you scroll up? And... Back to scroll up back to the theoretical framework. Okay. Okay. So here, here, you the the five constructs of um, compliance behavior, as you mentioned, five or four moral obligations. What did you expand? What what variable did you include? Religiosity. Okay, so hello. Yes. Um, hey, I'm, I was just asking, asking about uh, hmm. yes, the variable question. you include. You expanded on uh, because you, uh, I've seen that the inductive reasoning uh, entails expanding the theoretical framework and adding more variables. So you you included religiosity. Yes. Can, can you mute now? Uh, I see. Okay. I need to. All right. So the question is why uh, Islamic religiosity is included in this uh, framework. Okay. Um, okay. Islamic religiosity is included in this framework um, uh, to test whether religiosity uh, strengthen or weaken the relationship between uh, attitude, subjective norms, perceived behavioral control, and moral obligation. And the hypothesis is that 
uh, the more religious uh, uh, the person is, uh, the more likelihood that um, it will it will strengthen the relationship between these four constructs and the intention. For example, if a Muslim uh, has a positive attitude. Uh, it will uh, influence the intention to pay income zakat, right? And then if he is uh, more religious, then uh, the, the, it will strengthen the influence of attitude on intention. If he is uh, less, conversely, if he, he, if he is less religious, it will weaken the the relationship or the influence of attitude on the intention. So you need to uh, justify why you include. Uh, similarly, <coughs> for example, <coughs> moral obligation. If someone has a high moral obligation, meaning that uh, he feels that he or she is um, morally obligated to assist or to help the poor and the needy. Uh, it will influence uh, his or her intention to pay income tax. Okay, and <clears throat> if he is, um, uh, if he has a high moral obligation. And uh, at the same time, he is religious, then uh, it will strengthen uh, the relationship between moral obligation and intention. In other words, the more <coughs> uh, ethical or moral of the individual, uh, the more likely he or she has the intention to pay in Kanzakat. And um, if he or she is uh, more religious, he, he or she is uh, more likely to have the intention to pay income tax. Okay, so in your study, everything that you include, you need to be able to justify. So the justification, okay. Uh, uh, you can read um, here. Okay, the justification is here. This study considers the inclusion of religiosity because of the role it plays in influencing behavior. So far, there have been voluminous studies that have examined the impact of religiosity in many areas, including tax and zakat compliance. Such studies include Kamil, etc. Uh, however, these studies differ from the previous studies in that it employs religiosity measurement from an Islamic perspective. The previous studies use uh, religiosity, but this study use Islamic religiosity, which is religiosity measurement uh, from the Islamic perspective. The use of Islamic religiosity is important uh, because zakat payment is a religious obligation. And uh, the, in this study, the Islamic religiosity measurement uh, is adopted from uh, Krauss, Dr. Stephen Krauss. All right, any other question, uh, Dr. Sufyan? Okay, okay. Uh, clear, uh, very clear explanation about theory development and framework development. So you can add if you like anything. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. After the justifications of the inclusions of the variables in your theoretical framework, you need to develop hypotheses. So for example, the first attitude is, the first variable or construct is attitude. Then you need to develop 
the hypothesis. So the subtopic is hypothesis development of the variable, in this case, attitude. <coughs> How do you develop the hypothesis? Uh, first, you need to explain a little bit uh, the definition of the variable. So in this case, attitude can influence a person's intention by increasing the person's motivation to engage in a particular behavior. Individuals are more likely to engage in certain behaviors that are perceived to have favorable outcomes for them and are less likely to engage in activities that are associated with unfavorable outcomes. So all the variables that you include in the framework, you must really understand and being able to explain the meaning and the meaning uh, or the definitions must come from the authority for example in this case i i cite <coughs> eisen 2006 who is the pioneer of the theory of plant behavior in other words you cannot define the variable eco according to your own interpretation so there, there are some PhD students before who made a mistake of trying to define the variables according to his understanding, his or her understanding. That's not the way. You have to explain the variable as defined by the authority. Okay, then uh, you, you need to quote the previous studies which have used the variable, in this case, Eisen, um, Bobek, Hatfield, Zano, Marty, Bank, Haidt, Kamel, Zano, Ram, which have uh, used the variable and uh, the findings of their studies. And then uh, you need to justify uh, why the variables uh, have the relationship uh, with the uh, with the dependent variable or the mediating variable. So in this case, this study predicts that Muslim teachers with a positive attitude towards zakat compliance are more likely to develop strong intentions to comply with their zakat obligations. So that's why. So this is uh, reflected in the hypothesis. So you develop your first hypothesis. Uh, for example, attitude towards compliance behavior of income zakat has a positive, has a significant positive influence on the intention to pay income zakat. So in your, in the um, theoretical framework, it's a good idea to put H1 here. So H1 refers to the hypothesis number one. And then hypothesis number two um, is the hypothesis between subjective norm and intention. So Okay, so hypothesis number two, hypothesis development of subjective norm. Again, you need to explain a little bit about the meaning of a subjective norm according to authority. For example, here, based on Eisen, subjective norms refer to the influence of other people or reference group on a person's behavior. Subjective norms refer to a person's belief about whether the reference groups approve or disapprove a person's behavior and to what extent a person's behavior is influenced by the reference groups. So all these definitions must come from authority. And then you need to explain why uh, or how, how uh, 
uh, subjective norm can influence the intention. Uh, it's a good idea you quote the previous studies we have which uh, which have used uh, the subjective norm as the independent variable. And finally, you write something like this. So this study predicts or hypothesizes that in the context of zakat, Muslim teachers who fulfill the conditions of being zakat to believe an important reference expects them to comply with their zakat obligations will have will have strong intention. Okay, so your H two hypothesis two is subjective norms has a positive and significant influence on the intention to pay income and so on. So you, in this study, there's one hypothesis, one, two, three, four. And the fifth hypothesis, um, because there are four moderating uh, variables here, so uh, this researcher divides the fifth hypothesis into four, uh, four what do you call it? four different hypotheses. So hypothesis five A uh, try to hypothesis five A for example Islamic. Religiosity moderates the relationship between attitude and intention. 5B, Islamic religiosity moderates relationship between subjective norm and intention, uh, and so on. And then the last hypothesis is H6. Okay, so H6 is uh, intention has a positive and significant influence on compliance behavior. Okay, so you need to develop the hypothesis. Okay. Then the next step, you need to define uh, each of the variables we call operational def definitions and measurements of variables. In this section, you need to explain how you are going to measure each of the variable. For example, intention. How do you measure intention? Intention is something uh, which is in the heart, right? We cannot see. This is an abstract concept. However, for the purpose of research, we need to be able to measure the intention of the individuals. So in order to measure using questionnaire, you have to develop items. Okay, you have to develop items. So in this study, intention refers to the willingness and intention to pay income zakat to Kedah State uh, Department of Zakat. And the best way to write items is to adapt and adopt uh, items from previous studies. For example, this study ad adapt and adopt the items from Zainal 2008. And for the intention, uh, there are five items. For example, I will pay income zakat. And you need to mention the scale that you use. For example, the most common use, the, the most common scale is a liquid scale of five. For example, number one, strongly disagree. Number two, disagree. Score three, neutral or not sure neutral or not sure score four for agree and score five for strongly agree so if you have five items 
and the respondent answer five, which is strongly agree for each of the items, the highest total score is 25. So the higher the score means the higher the intention. Okay. And for attitude, okay, in order to cause, in order, before we uh, construct the items, we need to um, explain the operational definition. So the definition of attitude is adapted from who, all right? And then like before, uh, it's best that you adapt and adopt the items from previous studies. Okay, so in this item of attitude, there are 24 items. So every item is measured using a Likert scale of five. This is the same as before. So for each of the construct, you need to explain uh, how many items, what uh, scale that you use, and uh, what is the meaning of the score. All right. So for example, for subjective norms, um, there are how many? There are 20 items. Okay, so if um, the highest point would be 20 items times five, which is 100. So if the score is closer to 100, that means the subjective norms or the reference group uh, has, uh, um, there are many, uh, uh, there are, so the, the subjective norm um, is, uh, has, has a strong influence. Okay. Okay. Question so far? Mr. Hamza, any question? Tegu no more? No. No question, doctor. No question. If you don't ask question, I'm I'm mumbling. <laughs> Let's proceed. I'll show you an example of the questionnaire. Dr. Sofian, anything uh, you want to share? Or you want to? Uh, uh, bro, uh, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. You can ask many questions. <laughs> <laughs> no. For the question air, in Malaysia we should write in the English only or English and Malay? Okay, depends on the respondents. If the respondents can understand English, then uh, you distribute the questionnaire in English. If the respondents do not understand English, even if your thesis is in English, you need to write the questionnaire in Bahasa. Uh, okay, thank you, Rao. You're welcome. So in this case, uh, there are two versions of the questionnaire. One is in English, one is in Bahasa. All right. So let's look at the English version. So in actual, I distributed the questionnaire in Bahasa because most of the respondents um, um, not most, some of the respondents have trouble understanding the, the English. All right, so depends on the respondents. 
Okay, this the first part is usually the demography part. You might want to ask the gender, age, marital status, the level of education. Uh, this this depends. You might want to ask about the position, grade, and income. Usually, uh, they don't they don't fill out the questionnaire. Even if they don't fill out, it's all right. So this is the items for the attitude. Look at this. For attitude, there are 24 items. So how many items should you include? Uh, I think the more the better. Because later on, when you uh, analyze, okay, there are several steps. Uh, that you need to do um, and some of the items might have to be deleted if the items doesn't uh, pass the test of uh, reliability and validity all right so if you have for example few items um, and some of the items need to be deleted then you are left with very few items which is uh, which is uh, not which cannot be analyzed so the more items the better it doesn't have to be 24 there is no general rule of how many items so the way i see it you look at <coughs> the previous studies if they have more items for example, if they have 20 items, and you can choose 20 or 18 items. So the best way is to refer to the <coughs> previous studies. So these are called the items. Items number one, for example, paying zakat to Kedah State Department of Zakat purifies my income. I'm happy to pay income zakat to Kedah State Department of Zakat because it's managed by trained staff. And um, these items were adapted and adopted from the previous studies. So it's good that it's good if you can uh, make a note of the author or the previous studies which you have. Uh, adapt and adopt the questionnaire from. Okay. So after after you finish writing the items, it's best. Okay, so I just uh, scan through the items. Now it's, it's best that you do the pilot study. The purpose of the pilot study is to test whether the items are reliable and um, valid. So two tests, validity and reliability of the items in the questionnaire. Okay, any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Mr. Hamza, any question? No, doctor, I'm following very well. Okay. Then the next question is, uh, how do you uh, do the pilot study? How many? There is no magic answer. Some people distribute 50, some people 60, some people 100. And the respondents in the, in the pilot study uh, is usually different from the respondents in the in the actual survey so some people ask can can i include the um, the uh, the questionnaires from pilot study into the actual study um, there are 
differences in opinions. And in my opinion, it's best that we separate the pilot study from the actual uh, survey. All right, for example, the pilot study is done at Unishams, right? So the respondents are, for example, staff of Unisham. While the actual study, you go out and um, the respondents are, uh, you know, distributed throughout uh, the Kedah state. So the respondents of the pilot study is best if they are different from the uh, actual respondents. Okay, after you, you do the pilot study, you need to test for the validity and uh, reliability. Usually it's enough if you just use the Cronbach Alpha. If the value of the Cronbach Alpha is um, higher than 0 0.6, then the, um, the item is said to be valid and reliable. For example, in this study, uh, this study conducted a pilot study to test the validity and reliability of the questionnaire's instruments or items. So this study selected a total of 150 students. Okay. However, only 100 of them completed and returned the questionnaires. So, so there were 100 respondents who participated in the pilot study. And then uh, this study used Cronbach's Alpha. Cronbach's Alpha is a reliability coefficient which shows how well the items as a set are correlated to one another. The study computed Cronbach's Alpha in terms of the average intercorrelated among the items measuring the concepts. The closer Cronbach's alpha is to value of one, the higher the internal consistency reliability according to Sekaran 2003. Sekaran 2003 suggested that Cronbach's alpha values greater than 0 0.6 are sufficient for testing the reliability of factors. So for each of the items, okay, these are the Cronbach's alpha value, and all of them are greater than 0 0.6, which means that there is no need for alteration. Okay. Dr. Sofian, anything you would like to add? Uh, okay, bro, can I ask a question again? Oh, you can, you can ask many questions. Okay, in perceived behavior control, right. okay, the sum of the Kroba Alpha is 0 0.6. Okay. Uh -huh. So, uh, uh, that one is okay, or, or what, what, what should we say when our Kroba Alpha is a little bit low? Okay, according to Sekaran here, Sekaran 2003, Cronbach's uh, alpha value greater than 0 0.6 are adequate, are sufficient. Oh, okay, okay, I understand. To test uh, the reliability of factors. So as long as it is over 0 0.6, then it is sufficient. And we say the items are reliable. Okay, so for example, here knowledge is 0 0.608. So as long as it is above 0 0.6, uh, the items is said to be reliable. Okay. 
Gunoma, any question? No. No question. No question. Anything you want to add? Uh, I'm doing my um, pilot study. Uh, I'm doing uh, factor analysis. So, okay. uh, about um, how many samples, it depends on literature. Uh, according to her, uh, samples, uh, minimum 150 samples. Uh, it depends on uh, your literature review. Right, yes. Yeah, you need to justify why you choose 150. For yes. example, why you choose 100, for example. Yeah, good point. Okay. Azli, any question? Uh, that no, doctor. Okay. okay. Okay, okay. Dr. Sofian? Okay, bro. Okay. Okay. So we can continue, huh? Yes. Okay. So now... The next thing is to collect the data, right? Once the questionnaire is ready, then uh, you need to collect the data. Here, you need to specify uh, the survey method that, that uh, uh, you use. And it's best that you can justify why you use the questionnaire. For example, okay, this study uses survey method using questionnaires to collect data. This method is considered suitable. Why? Because units of analysis or respondents are scattered around the state of Kedah. And uh, the advantage of using questionnaires is the data can be obtained effectively, concisely, and fast. Who says? Dickman, 2003. Okay, and then you need to explain how the questionnaire is distributed. The researcher distributes and meets personally with respondents after the sampling process is completed. And then you need to explain a little bit about how the questionnaire uh, is organized. For example, part A, demography, part B, attitude, part C, subjective norm, and etc. So in this questionnaire, there are uh, many parts, A through O. Okay. And you need to explain about the unit of analysis. The unit of analysis refers to the subject that is being studied in the research. So unit of analysis for this study is the individual Muslims public school teachers who are eligible to pay income zakat located in the state of Qatar. And then uh, you need to explain about population and sampling. According to Zikman 2013, population is defined as a complete group of entities which share common characteristics. So you need to explain the population of the study in, in your context. And then you need to determine the sample size. There are many uh, criteria in choosing the sample size. One of the most, one of the popular criteria is Krishi and Morgan, 1970. 
So this uh, study choose uh, the criteria of based on uh, Krishi, Krishi and Morgan 1970. This is the formula. And this is a table. So for example, uh, the population of the study is around 13,000, right? So 13,000 is between 10,000 to 15,000. Okay. So this is the population, okay? So the sample size must be between 370 to 375, right? So in this study, okay, based on Krishi and Morgan, if the population is 13,000, 13,000 lies between 10 and 15,000, then the sample size should be between 370 and 375 here. And this study choose 372, just a number between 370 and 375. Then you need to explain the procedure. There are many uh, sampling uh, procedure, simple random sampling, stratified uh, sampling, cluster sampling, and then you, uh, you need to explain. Uh, yeah, yeah, boleh. If the population is larger than 100k, so so oh, what number of sample should we use? 384. Uh, it is larger than 100, eh, 1 million. Uh, this, this is 1 million. 1 million. Oh, okay. This, 100k this, or 1 million that one? This is 1 million. 1 million. Oh, okay. So the highest is 384. Okay, I understand. So it's manageable, uh, 384, right? <laughs> so the minimum is 384? Maximum. Maximum? Yes. According to Krishi and Morgan, uh, which is manageable, right? 384. Okay. <clears throat> Then you need to choose the sampling technique. So we have a simple random sampling, cluster sampling, a stratified sampling. Um, uh, okay, so so it depends on what. Uh, uh, it depends on uh, the researcher, how they want to what 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 kind of sampling technique they, they choose. As long as the, the selection procedure is uh, justified, you need to justify why. For example, in this case, the, uh, the study choose cluster sampling technique. <coughs> okay. Why you use cluster sampling technique, how you use, then you need to explain. Okay. So in this case, the researcher uh, used the cluster sampling technique. So first, the, the study groups the schools into 11 clusters, because in Kedah, we have uh, 11 districts. And the list of schools is selected based on the list provided by JPN. A simple random sampling is used to select 558 respondents from school. Why, <coughs> why this study choose five, 558 and not 372? Okay. Uh, um, a researcher is allowed to distribute more in case, in case um, some of the respondents do not respond, right? So this study selects 558 respondents. Why? Because according to Salkin 2012 and Butler uh, 
uh, Kotlik and Higgins 2001 to make provisions for the possibility of low response, the researcher is allowed to distribute 50% more than the required 50% more than the required sample size needed. So for the purpose of this study, the total number of questionnaires distributed equals the number of sample size requ required, 372 plus 0 0.5 times 372, which is 372 plus 186, which is 558. Okay. So in order to ensure the high response rate, the researcher himself went to each of the schools. Okay. It was not uh, through mail because um, the researcher was afraid if the questionnaires were mail, then the response rate would be very low. So the best way is to see the respondents uh, and give them time to to fill out and pujuk pujuk lah. You try to persuade them, convince them to cooperate with you. Okay. And in the end, out of 558, the questionnaires filled and returned were was a 400 and 402 questionnaires. So this is higher than the target of. 372. Okay. And for the analysis, this study uses a PLS SAM in the analysis of data. Okay, why uh, the study chose PLS SAM? One of the reasons for using PLS SAM is when the structural model is complex. Uh, meaning the theoretical framework is complex. It has mediating variable and also the moderating variable. Okay, that's why um, PLSM is chosen. According to her 2011, the selection of PLSM is more appropriate when extending an existing theory which is what this study attempts to do. Moreover, the advantage of PLSM is that it can estimate measurement model and structural model simultaneously. So using PLSM, there are three stages. The first stage involves data screening process and, diagnos and diagnostic tests. Okay, so the purpose of the screening and diagnostic test is to test whether the data is suitable or not to be used for the purpose of statistical analysis. Okay, you need to test. Some of the students, they didn't test, which is a big mistake. Uh, the second stage is performing the assessment of measurement model to identify the underlying structure of uh, the variables. And then the third stage, the assessment of structural model and the data is run using PLSM to determine what we call the path model uh, to show which variables are significant. So basically there are three steps in PLSM. Okay, and uh, you need to explain each of, the, each of the steps. Step one is data screening process and diagnostic test. All right, stage two assessment of measurement model. You need to test whether each of the items pass through the reliability and uh, validity test. You need to test for the reliability and validity of each of the items. All right. And then in the third stage, after passing through the second stage, 
then you assess the structural model, you assess the significance and relevance of the relationships. Okay. Okay, I want to stop here for questions. Any questions? Anyone familiar with PLSM? Mr. Hamza, are you familiar not with? Familiar. No, okay. not familiar. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, share with you the videos on how to use PLSM. Uh, the only thing is you need to pay. Uh, if you download PLSM, they will give you one month trial. Then uh, after one month, uh, you cannot use. So the way I do it is, uh, okay, I, I, when I want to use it, I, I only pay when I want to use it. Okay. So the first uh, 30 days, you can use a PLSM uh, just to learn and to do the pilot study maybe. You need to pay, but it's not much. You, you can pay for how long you want to use. For example, for one month, you pay for one month. You can, you can download. PLS, uh, you go, you go, you go to Google, right? Okay. You say download PLS same version. Three. Okay, download PLSM version three. Okay, then you click download here. Okay, download latest version smart PLS. 3.3.2, all right? So if you use window, you can download here, all right? And then just follow the step. I already download, so I cannot click here. Okay. Okay. Uh, PLSM Smart, Smart PLS version 2.0 uh, is free, but uh, it allows only up to 100 Respondents. So you you have to use this one. If you don't want to use, don't download it yet because it, it, once you download, it will start the free three day trial, right? Okay. Yes. So you download you you don't you download when you want to use. Um, I will give you the videos on how to use. Okay. Any, any questions so far? Take no more. Any anything? Okay. No, doctor. Thank you very much. Okay. What else? Huh? If you don't have questions, I don't know what. What else I want to cover? <laughs> you can. You're free to ask any questions, Doctor Sofian. Uh, uh, problem. Problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in your thesis, you use PLSM, is it? Yes. Can, can I use AMOS, SPSS AMOS? 
Yes, you are free to use Amos. If you oh, are, okay. if you are used to Amos, you are free to use Amos. Uh, Amos is free, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, then it's better to use Amos. It depends on which software you are familiar with. Okay, thank you, bro. You're welcome. You can teach me how to use Amos. <laughs> no, I will learn from you. <laughs> uh, I, I used to, I used to be able to use Amos some time ago, but since I switched to PLS, some of the steps in Amos are already forgot. <laughs> yeah, but it's okay if you want to use Amos. And of course, if you use Amos, Amos, the way you write is slightly different from this thesis. This is based on PLS. So there is a slight difference on the steps in measuring uh, structural, what do you call, uh, the assessment model and the structural model. Okay. Any other question? What time is it? What else? I think I think that's about it. Uh, the the use of questionnaires in your study. Okay. Uh, next topic, we will discuss uh, the qualitative research, the population and sampling in qualitative research in next class. Okay, so uh, we are about done with the quantitative uh, research. Okay, as a reminder, um, at the end of this, um, two events will be happening. Number one, okay, take, take note. Number one, we will have uh, International Conference on Islamic, uh, International Conference on Contemporary Issues in Islamic Finance, which is scheduled on 13 through, on 11 through 13 of October. And the deadline to submit full paper and video is 30th of September. It costs only ringgit, uh, 50 ringgit for local and 80 ringgit for international students, international participants. I think it's the cheapest seminar in the world. So please take advantage and present. And event number two, if possible, when you are ready, for those who have already registered, you can present Colloquium 1. It is scheduled uh, late the last week of November. Okay, The date will be announced, but it's during the last week of November. So whether you are masters or PhD students, please be ready to take part uh, in the first colloquium. All you have to do is finish up your chapter one and present your chapter one. Okay. Okay. Mr. Hamza, you can be ready also. Yeah, I will be ready, inshallah. I'm registering. Okay, inshallah, you can read it. So the colloquium is most probably online also. The seminar and colloquium is online. Okay, we use Zoom. Okay. Dr. Roslan, you ready? Inshallah. Huh? Uh, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Sofian, inshallah. Inshallah. 
end of November, inshallah. Okay. Adli, are you ready for the curriculum? Inshallah. Just present your chapter one. Eh? Okay. There are certain forms you need to fill out. Uh, do you have uh, the number of the the phone number of Dr. Tahir? You can ask Dr. Tahir who will organize the seminar. Do you have the phone number of Dr. Tahir? Ada betul. Ada dalam brochure juga. Ada dalam uh, ada dalam ni. Dalam portal. Ada dalam iklan ni. Dalam portal lah. Otherwise, I will send to the WhatsApp group. Dr. Sohel is our postgraduate coordinator. Okay, I think that's about it for today's class. If you don't have any questions. Okay, can can we stop here? Yes. Okay. okay, thank you, bro. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you, everybody. So, any questions? You're welcome. You can... Thank you, Magazine. Okay, sama -sama. Any questions you can ask me or PM me. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.